Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Nate Collister, uh, Wells Fargo Bank, and it is my great privilege today to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Gary Crittenden. Gary currently serves as an executive director of Huntsman Gay Global Capital, where he also previously, previously served as CEO and chairman. Prior to uh, Huntsman Gay Global, uh, Gary was the CFO to a number of large companies, including Sears Roebuck, Monsanto, American Express, and was also the chairman of City Holding and CFO of Citigroup during the great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. On three separate occasions, Gary was named one of the best CFOs in America by Institutional Investor Magazine. He earned his bachelor's degree from BYU and his MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Gary Crittenden. This microphone, right? Can you hear me okay? Uh, it's uh, really a treat for me to uh, be here with you today. I noticed uh, a few old friends when I was coming in the, in the door. Uh, this was my uh, 50th high school reunion this last weekend, and uh, I was really struck how crazy it was that there were some people who had changed so much that they didn't recognize me. And, uh, and so, uh, anyway, it's nice to see some old uh, friends and to be with you uh, today. Uh, we were talking a bit earlier, and Dave asked me if I wanted to show any PowerPoint slides, and I'm actually not going to show any PowerPoint slides today. The reason for that is that I, over time I've developed this perspective that every human being only actually has a limited number of PowerPoint presentations they can actually sit through, and when you get to your last one, it turns out that you actually die. And uh, I didn't want to have anybody reach their last one today because I wanted you all to have a safe day and to get out of here okay. So no PowerPoint presentations. Uh, as, we as we go through, I'm going to uh, go through some uh, lessons learned from financial crisis and about the uh, you know, things to think about uh, you know, potentially for the future. Uh, I thought what I should do is maybe give you a sense of the, uh, uh, the risk associated with taking any advice uh, from me. So, uh, years ago when I was uh, thinking about leaving American Express to go to Citigroup, I talked to as many friends about it as I thought would be a reasonable thing to do. And there was a, a guy that was a vice chairman of one of the large investment banks that had been a long time sort of advisor to me. And, uh, and so I decided that I would call him on the phone and talk it through with him. And uh, so we talked it through and you know, the various pros and cons and what the risk might be, that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and I concluded that as we were uh, kind of talking together, and this was now in February of 2007, I concluded by saying, I don't know how I can lose. It sounds great. And of course, uh, I did join uh, Citigroup in February of uh, 2007, and uh, within a couple of quarters of me joining the company, we were in the middle of the financial crisis. So take that into account as you kind of listen to a little bit of advice from me. I think if time works out okay, uh, we'll have a chance for a few uh, questions at the end, so please feel free to think about things as I'm talking here for just a minute. But let me maybe start with the first example that I have, which uh, relates to American Express. So, on uh, November, uh, on September 11, uh, 2001, uh, I was sitting in my conference room on the 51st floor of uh, One uh, World Financial Center, uh, which is uh, right off of. Uh, uh, the West Side Highway, uh, separated by the West Side Highway from the North Tower of the uh, World Trade Center. Uh, we were having a conference call with a set of folks in London, uh, and I was in the conference room with the head of technology from American Express. And uh, oftentimes, if you know where that building is located, it's located right on the Hudson River, uh, there are planes that fly from an Air Force base uh, up north of New York City and fly down uh, the Hudson River, and when they go by, they make a huge amount of noise. Any of you who live up in, uh, in Davis County know that from Miller Force Base, what it sounds like, so it's very loud. And uh, so anyway, we, we heard a loud noise like that, and it drew all of our attention uh, back and to the left in that conference room, and, uh, and we saw what many of you have now seen uh, as a large passenger plane uh, was flying towards the uh, North Tower. And, uh, and obviously the, the plane uh, hit the North Tower, and at the time that it hit, 
it created an enormous explosion. So we were about 100 yards inside our building away from where the impact of the plane was. And uh, even today, I can feel uh, sort of the concussion associated with that, uh, with that plane going into the building and the heat associated with the initial fireball that happened when the plane hit the building. It was, uh, it was terrifying. We thought it was an accident, obviously. Uh, I, uh, I called my, my wife and, and uh, told her that, uh, that I was fine. And, uh, and, and again, we assumed this was an accident. And of course, uh, about 20 or 30 minutes later, the other plane flew into the South Tower, which we couldn't see from our perspective on, on our, our building. But the plane flew into the South Tower, and we knew that there was a significant crisis happening. Ken Chenault, who was the CEO of American Express at the time, was actually here in Salt Lake. Uh, American Express had, at the time, a uh, traveler's check processing center here on I-215. Uh, the, the facility is still there, but it does different things today. And Ken was here at that facility, and uh, there were two or three of us in senior leadership who happened to be in the building that day. So your first reaction, at least my first reaction, when something like that happens is to run. Uh, so I, I went down the elevator and walked by the security office, and then I realized, uh, you know, we really had the obligation to make sure everyone got out of our building safely. And uh, so I went back upstairs, and over the course of the next uh, couple of hours, we got all 5,560 American Express employees out of the building and, and out onto the street, and had gone back up to the 48th floor of our building, uh, in the office of a fellow by the name of Tom Schick, who was the head of public affairs for American Express. And uh, so we were there when suddenly there was this enormous shaking of our building. And uh, of course, this was still a time of great confusion, and we thought our building had been impacted by a plane. That was what our assumption was, given the way that it shook. It turns out this was the collapsing of the South Tower. So even though the South Tower was hit first, it actually collapsed. Hit second, it actually collapsed first. So the South Tower went down. So we started running down the stairs, and we ran from 48 floors up down to the bottom. And we came to the lobby and opened the door of the lobby, and the lobby was filled with that ash and smoke that you're familiar with. And uh, so anyway, we ran out through the uh, parking garage, uh, there was a horrific scene of carnage on the street. I think most people, you know, watch these newsreels of what happened and it ignores, although obviously the tragic deaths of many, there were many, many people who were wounded or injured in some way because of that who were out on the street. We did what we could to help those who were close by where we were, and then a couple of us made our way across the Hudson River on a ferry over to the American Express building uh, in uh, Jersey City, where I spent uh, a good portion of that next day. Uh, it was a, this, this was an event that was like custom tailored uh, to negatively impact American Express business. Now, that was the last thing on our minds at the time that this happened. Uh, obviously, our, well, our thoughts were for the welfare of the employees of the company and for all those who had been so devastatingly impacted by this whole thing. But at any rate, that's, uh, it, it was kind of the last thing on our minds. As I got to the building in Jersey City, I had a phone call. So I had left my cell phone, brilliant as I was, in the building when we ran. I, I, you know, I just left it sitting there. Uh, and so uh, in Jersey City, I get a phone call, and the phone call is from one of the rating agencies. And the rating agency is informing me that they're going to downgrade our debt. And uh, this is literally like three hours after you know, the, the building across the street had been bombed. So as you might, might think, I was happy about this. <laughs> and I, I told the guy on the phone, uh, look, uh, there's no way in the world that you can know, because we have no idea what this means. There's no way you can know what it means. Uh, but nonetheless, they did, they did downgrade us that day. And, that set in motion a series of things within American Express that are sort of the first lesson that I'm going to talk about today. So, as I said, this was kind of a custom tailored event to really negatively impact uh, the company. And uh, so we had a lot of charge volume in New York City. We did a lot of business travel. Uh, we had a lot of business spending on American Express cards. And all of that stopped. Remember, the planes were shut down. Uh, some people got stranded because you really couldn't go anywhere. But uh, Things were, things were pretty well uh, locked down. And uh, 
So uh, we went through a, kind of an exercise, and I'm sure many of you have been through this, about how we were going to lock down our costs and really cut costs a lot. So the whole company was focused over the next little while. I should say, by the way, that when the North Tower eventually fell, it collapsed into our building and caused our building to be completely non-functional. So the, the building itself was significantly damaged by the collapse of the North Tower. So we didn't have a headquarters. Uh, we, we were in a pretty uh, tough situation. And so we went through this cost-cutting exercise and everybody in the company was figuring out how they could cut this cost and that cost and you know, get out of uh, you know, agreements that we had made legally and, and you know, that, that sort of thing. And one night I was home in my home office and I got a phone call uh, from Ken Chenault, who's an absolutely wonderful guy, and was my boss, and uh, and Ken says, you know, you know, I've been thinking about this whole thing. You know, everybody's really focused on cost reduction, which which is a good thing. I'm really glad we're focused on cost reduction. It's it's great, but uh, I gotta tell you, I'm tired of having everybody look inside. So why don't we do something like this? And so he said, why don't we get everybody to make a list? If, if we had $100,000, what's the first thing they'd spend $100,000 on? What's the second thing they'd spend $100,000 on? What's the third thing they'd spend $100,000 on? And, uh, and let's just put that on the shelf. And let's call this play to win. Uh, and uh, so, which says if we actually end up better than we currently think we are, we're gonna know where we're gonna invest our money. And uh, I have to admit that my reaction to this was, uh, what planet is this guy on, right? Because we had just been through this incredibly difficult circumstance. But as a dutiful soldier, uh, that was you know, something that, that uh, we did. And we went through with each of the organizations, just like you would a budget review, and identified these things that we could do that might help the company uh, improve if things ended up better. And by the way, we also developed a list of things we would cut still if things worked out worse than we thought. And, lo and behold, as you might guess, things did work out better than we anticipated. So credit losses ended up being significantly lower than what we thought. We actually then began a process of reviewing each of these proposed uh, kind of uh, business activities and funded a significant number of those. And that was sort of the start of what ended up being about eight years of terrific performance from American Express, where we had uh, high single-digit revenue growth, uh, between 12 and 15 percent EPS growth, and had a very nice appreciation in the stock price uh, as, as a result of that. So here's, here's the lesson that I learned from that. Uh, spending a lot of time actually doing a budget, the detail of a budget, is not particularly worthwhile. Because as you know, a budget is, is really obsolete the day that it's finished. Uh, by the time you get there, you know, everything has changed, and so it's, it's already obsolete. So particularly to do kind of a cost center, line item detail budget simply does not make sense unless you have some other purpose for doing it. However, developing a budgeting and planning process that is very flexible, that allows you to react to the environment, either by investing faster in things that you otherwise would not have done and already knowing the return and rank ordering those in your head, or knowing what you're going to cut back if you have to cut back can actually allow you to work your way through very difficult financial situations in ways that allow kind of a positive response. I'm familiar with a company here in Salt Lake that's had an extraordinary track record over the last six or seven years. And, uh, and when the pandemic hit, uh, there, was, there was real concern that it would have an impact on their business. If I told you what business line it was and the channels it was sold through, you'd, you'd recognize quickly that it could be at risk. Uh, and so initially we put together kind of a couple of scenarios that how the world might uh, kind of evolve. But then we agreed that instead of that, maybe what we would do is plan flexibly. So as the business evolved uh, over time, that flexibility could either be invested or it could be held back. And, uh, and it's been an extraordinary experience. So over the course of the pandemic, uh, in spite of the fact that their channels got completely turned uh, upside down, the performance actually beat the original plan uh, from last year uh, when the pandemic happened. And so lesson number one, hopefully it's helpful for you, but lesson number one is don't waste time on too detailed planning. There has to be some. 
Focus more on flexibility of your planning and forecasting process, adding in things, taking out things as you go and help bring your business folks along with that. We talk about number two. Number two is a city group experience. How are we doing on time here? We're okay. So uh, number two is a city group experience. So I mentioned I came here at the start of the financial crisis. Um, just to let you know how crazy things were once we got into the crisis, uh, I got a phone call one morning uh, from a guy by the name of Eric Dash, who was the uh, big bank uh, reporter for the New York Times. Eric has since become a really good friend of mine. He's no longer a reporter, or we probably wouldn't be friends, but uh, anyway, he's a good friend of mine, R really brilliant guy. So he says to me, uh, hey, listen, Gary, this is after we had received TARP funds from the federal government. So you might remember that. That's the government subsidies that they provided to the banking industry. So this is after we had received TARP funds from the government. He says, I heard today that American Express, or I'm sorry, that Citigroup is, uh, is buying a new G5. Uh, is that correct? And I said, Eric. That's, that's not correct. That's crazy. I said, if, if we were doing that, I would know about it. There's no way that the company's buying a new G5. That's absolutely crazy. He said, okay, but I got a couple of uh, sources, and unless you can give me something concrete, I'm going to press at 5 o'clock. So I went into the chief administrative officer who was responsible for aviation, and I said to him, uh, I got the craziest call from, uh, from uh, Eric Dash. Uh, he says, that we have bought a G5. Can you believe that? And his face got white. <laughs> he said, actually, we did buy one. And then he started to go through this kind of rationale. Well, if we buy this one, then we can retire another one, and this is more fuel efficient, and it saves us $15 million a year, whatever whatever it happened to be, some number like that. And uh, I, said, I said, look, it doesn't matter how much it saves us or what it is, we cannot by a G5. So by today at 4.30, whatever you have to do, we can no longer own that plane. <laughs> so long story short, we paid a princely sum to get out of that contract and give it to some other Middle Eastern country that ended up taking that, uh, taking that plane. But that was sort of the chaotic environment that, uh, that we were in at the time. Uh, it, it was an incredible time at Citigroup uh, when I first showed up. So the company had made about $6 billion in income uh, the first quarter I was there. And uh, within two quarters, that $6 billion had dropped to $1.2 billion, and then it became decidedly negative as we went into 2008. So it was a very difficult time. The first lesson uh, that I kind of take away from that, second lesson for today overall, but the first lesson has to do with kind of the core of what caused the financial crisis to happen. So. Um, as, as you probably know, interest rates, you certainly know, interest rates have been low for a very long period of time. That was true during the financial crisis. It hasn't really changed. Uh, since then, they're still uh, ridiculously uh, low. That has made it difficult for, uh, for uh, institutions like insurance companies to earn sufficient yield on their investments to honor the contracts that they have for people that they insure. It's just difficult. They have a mix of stocks and bonds in their models. And when you can only earn 1.25% uh, on 10-year treasuries, the blended mix of stocks and bonds puts them in a difficult position to reach what they need to reach. So they all needed to get yield. And banks, being enterprising institutions that they are, came up with a way to provide those yields. And that uh, innovation was called collateralized debt obligation, so CDOs. Now, here's how a CDO works. I'm sure many of you here probably know this, but here's how it works. It's a structured financial instrument. You take a bunch, in this case it was subprime mortgages, it could be anything, but it was subprime mortgages. You put them into a big pool, and then you slice it up, usually into four separate tranches. And if somebody buys the highest rated tranche, the top of the, the, top of the kind of pool, they have claim on the cash flows all the way up. And uh, so if somebody defaults in their group, it, they're okay because they're able to get cash flows from other tranches. Well, this would be, a, and, and, it, and it gave them an enhanced return. The problem was it turned out that the, the, the buyers of these CDOs only wanted to buy the top, most protected tranches. And so Citigroup, like many other institutions, 
for years had been manufacturing these CDOs and selling them, but keeping the, the bottom end of the tranches that had the least claim on cash flow if something went wrong on its balance sheet, marked at full market uh, value. Now, these uh, securities on the Citigroup balance sheet were rated by the rating agencies. You're going to see a common theme here about my affection for rating agencies. Were rated by the rating agencies as triple A plus. I remember somebody from the investment bank saying to me once, this is better than GE. In fact, it's better than the federal government of the United States, which is only rated triple A. So uh, anyway, so they, they were uh, on our balance sheet. And uh, so we considered them to be highly rated securities. We didn't think of them as being subprime securities, and we said as much externally, that we, we thought we had about 9 to $12 billion worth of exposure in subprime, and that was sort of the limits of our exposure. So we were going along through the second quarter, and, or third quarter, sorry, and I got a phone call from the fellow who was the chief financial officer of the investment bank uh, uh, at Citigroup. And he said, the weirdest thing is going on. He said, I, I, we're not getting the interest payments off of the CDO positions that we have at the rate that we should get them. I, he said, I can't understand why they're not paying through. And I was really busy, it was a Thursday. I said, look, I don't have time to deal with this right now, but let's meet in on Saturday and we'll figure this whole thing out. So Saturday we met at the conference center that Citigroup had uh, just next to White Plains Airport. And, uh, and went through this conversation. And, uh, and to make a very long conversation short, we discovered the fact that because the interest payments were being paid up to the top of the structure, because the underlying uh, you know, defaults were very high among these subprime mortgages, there simply was not enough cash flow to cover the uh, payments that we needed to have in order to justify the valuation of these assets. And, uh, we did a little homework on this, and it turns out that the number was not 9 to 12 billion, but the number was around $60 billion. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but $60 billion is actually a lot of money to me. So it was a big, it was a big uh, uh, number. So I called Chuck Prince on the phone. So Chuck Prince is the CEO of America, uh, Citigroup, a really wonderful, talented guy, in spite of what you might have read. He really is a great, uh, capable man. And uh, I, said, I said, Chuck, uh, where are you? He says, oh, I'm driving. He was in South Carolina somewhere. He said, I'm driving from here to there. And I said, well, maybe you ought to pull over. And so anyway, he pulled over. And I said, look, here's the situation. Now we had 9 to 12. We actually had 60. He said, how much do you think the write-off could be? I said, I think it could be as much as $45 billion. Uh, and uh, it actually ended up being somewhere in the 50s. I can't remember, 57 or something like that. And uh, he said, I'm going to have to resign. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to have to. There's no way, given what I've committed to for, that I can do that. And so that was Saturday. You can read all about this in the Wall Street Journal if you ever have interest. But that was on a Saturday. And uh, by Monday, Chuck had made the difficult decision to step down as the CEO of Citigroup. So what actually happened here? What actually happened? And I think therein is actually the lesson that I wanted to focus on. So what happened was, Citigroup was putting on product on its balance sheet that actually created net income. So reported net income. So you, let's say you put a dollar in a mutual fund and it pays dividends, you're gonna actually get money in. What they didn't account for was the full cost, in the case of banking, the full cost of capital to be able to justify keeping that on their balance sheet. So in reality, even though it was generating income, Citigroup's income was growing at 10% a year, the full cost, once you added in the cost of capital, was actually below the cost of capital, and shareholder value was being destroyed by every dollar put onto the balance sheet. Now here's the lesson. The lesson is that unless you consider the unit economics of what you're adding to your business, you're probably accounting for things that at the end of the day are not going to be helpful to you. So here's an example. If you have uh, reoccurring revenue that you're being judged on, as an example, like many of us are, today it's, it's a, a hot thing. People think less about profitability and more about things like reoccurring revenue. If you're being judged on reoccurring revenue and you put on business that adds to reoccurring revenue, but you know in your heart 
does not capture the full cost of adding that, that customer in. If you look at that customer today, even though there's, there's overhead, obviously, that you have to put against that margin, uh, if you look at that customer today, that customer has to be contributing positively to that overhead. If they're not, then I would argue that you're adding reoccurring revenue below the cost of capital and actually paradoxically destroying shareholder value in your company. So your job is to be the defender of that, to be on the front lines of preventing bad business going on to your income statement and balance sheet in the spirit of trying to grow something that investors will value. Citigroup thought that it was doing things that would be positive for investors as a result of what they, what they did. Still got a few more minutes, Dave, right? So let me move now to, to uh, number three here for just a second. Um, and I'll be a little quicker about this just given the time that we have. Um, so number three is uh, kind of an interesting situation. I was, uh, so now Chuck Prince has left American, has left Citigroup. Uh, Vikram Pandit is the new CEO. Uh, Vikram's a great, smart guy. And uh, it's a Friday afternoon about three o'clock. My office is right next to his. He says, why don't you come over uh, and chat with me? So I went to see him and he said, uh, he said the weirdest thing, I just got a phone call from Tim Geithner, who was the head of the New York Fed. And Tim says he wants me to come down to uh, the Fed this afternoon, that he has something he needs to talk to us about. And I'm thinking, wow. So like, we have never been kind of asked to go to the Fed on, particularly on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock. So you know, what in the world is going on? And he also said, by the way, when you come, we want you to go through the back door, <laughs> not the front door, and, uh, and we'll have your name on a list there. So anyway, we went down in the car, we went around to the back of the Fed, uh, we pulled in the parking garage, garage and they had a little list there. And then somebody came and ushered us into a conference room and we ended up sitting in this conference room for like the next two and a half hours uh, looking at each other. Now Vikram Pandit is a fun guy to talk to, but two and a half hours looking at him face to face seemed a little long for me. But anyway, so long story short, uh, we were there for two and a half hours. They finally then ushered us into a larger conference room. And uh, in the large conference room are essentially the, the, the CFO and CEOs of the largest 11 financial institutions in the United States. Noticeably missing is one, which is Lehman Brothers. And so it didn't take long for everybody in the room to surmise that we had all been called to the Fed to discuss Lehman Brothers and what the future of Lehman Brothers might be. Now, any of you who have watched any of these movies, uh, like Too Big to Fail or The Big Short, have seen the mock-ups or you know, the kind of replays of the drama of this meeting. But it was a very dramatic session where people argued whether or not, that basically the federal government said they were not going to bail anybody else out. So, uh, sorry about that. So they, were not, they said they were not going to bail anybody else out. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, and so if, if Lehman Brothers was going to be saved, it was going to be because of the financial institutions that were in the room. Uh, and uh, again, to make a very long story short, there was an argument that took place. On the one hand, a, a CEO of a company that you all would know well, and you would know his name if I told you, said that there is no way we could bail out Lehman Brothers, because if we bail them out forever, there would be a call on our balance sheets, which would increase our cost of capital and make us uncompetitive worldwide. Reasonable argument, that's what he said. There was another guy you've never heard of who said, it doesn't matter because if we don't bail them out, the world as we know it will no longer exist. And those were sort of the two points. We went back and forth fighting between us on those two. It went all night that night. It went all day the next day. So by Sunday night, I'm still in my exact same clothes I was in Friday when we made this trip down to the Fed. And we had actually worked out a deal with Lehman Brothers to make this all happen. But at the end, it was $16 million, by the way, to put it into context. Citigroup had a $2.3 trillion balance sheet, so $16 billion to us was a bit of a rounding error. So if you had you know, 11 banks putting up this kind of money, it would have been a nothing to actually do it. But we couldn't get competitors to agree. And by the way, it had been competitive discussions had been waived by the SEC during the course of this process as well. So it ended up not happening. And I, I honestly thought that the world truly would come to an end as a result of that. So I remember leaving there early Sunday morning, it was probably two o'clock, it was raining outside. We lived at Columbus Circle and I can remember going out and catching a cab and thinking people simply don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow at eight o'clock. 
So eight o'clock comes and goes, and uh, <laughs> and uh, nothing happens, and uh, and that whole day nothing happens. And we have a board meeting uh, in Paris for Tuesday, and so we fly over Monday night for this board meeting on Tuesday. And I can remember giving a presentation to the board where I said, uh, "Look, uh, I don't really understand it." but we're still funding fine. Our overnight paper is clearing, just as you might expect it. It's a little hard for me to see. I really expected something totally different. And, uh, but for, for right now, everything is fine. So we get back on the plane, we fly back, we land in London. Our, uh, those little devices we used to have, uh, Blackberries, that blew up uh, with messages when we got off the plane. And during the course of that plane flight, everything that I had worried about basically did happen. So our overnight funding had completely drawn, uh, dried up. We, we did probably 13 or 14 billion dollars worth of overnight funding, which we needed to have to make, meet obligations the next, the next day, and that basically stopped. So the government was then put in a position of allowing the Fed to provide a lot more cash into the banking system far more cash than ever would have been required to save Lehman Brothers to begin with. Uh, less, obviously, than what we would have needed to put in to have Lehman Brothers survive. Uh, all of that ended up actually working out in a way that uh, it put all of the industry into a very tough spot. So, in, in answer to that, what we were trying to do is uh, figure out a way to get proper liquidity. And do any of you remember Wachovia Bank? If, you've, if you can, yeah, just give me a sense if you remember Wachovia. So, a very interesting thing happened. So Wachovia got itself into trouble, like many financial institutions. Uh, the Fed required them to be sold, and so they put themselves up for sale. Really good management team, but they had a mortgage business in California that had really gotten killed. So uh, we looked at it. it. We thought it was going to be too expensive for us. We gave a price that uh, what we would pay. We thought they would never agree to it. But it turns out that no, no other buyers came to the party. And so I was sleeping on the couch in my office the across from me was a guy named Andy Fellner, who was also sleeping on my couch, who was our M&A lawyer. And we get a call uh, from one of the top regulators, whose name you'd recognize, at about 11.30 at night, who says, uh, you know, we, there's nobody else bidding, so you guys are sort of the last uh, kind of candidate standing. And so anyway, we worked out a deal to buy Wachovia. Some of you may remember this. We, uh, by that morning, we announced it. Uh, it's the worst. Uh, it's the worst investor call I have ever done in my life. If you ever want to hear something really bad <laughs> to make yourself feel better, because I only kind of knew this business for five or six hours when we did the investor call. But uh, we, hadn't, we had signed the intent to acquire the company, obviously, in the five hours between uh, one o'clock or so and when we had to get on the, on the line with investors. But we hadn't actually signed the deal, so the deal was still in negotiation. So that went on then for the next uh, kind of, uh, uh, let's see, uh, probably the next four days, so it was Monday to Thursday. And Thursday night I get a phone call from, uh, my, from Andy Felder, the M&A lawyer, and Andy says, uh, boy, things are great, we're in good shape, there's only nine deal points left, uh, these are all non-business deal points, you can go to bed, don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine, when you wake up tomorrow the deal will be done. So anyway, 3.15 in the morning, I get a phone call from Vikram Pandit. Vikram says, the first thing he says to me when I pick up the phone is, they took it away from us. I said, what do you mean they took it away from us? He said, you know, I, the, they, they're going to give it to Wells Fargo. Now, I know Wells Fargo is a, a partner here, and I'm a customer of Wells Fargo. It's a great institution. <laughs> but the, but they're gonna, they're, they gave it to Wells Fargo. And, uh, and so, uh, it put us in a terrible position because we had announced that we were going to get all these deposits from Wachovia, which would have solidified our funding. And uh, so I had a phone call with Tim Geithner, and uh, this is now the next morning. I'm saying, Tim, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, this is going to be a disaster. I said, if this decision is actually made the way you say it, I don't know if it's going to be six days, six months, or six years from now, but I, Citigroup is going to be the institution that needs to be bailed out not Wachovia and others. Of course, Citigroup was a much larger entity. Uh, nothing changed, and that deal went through, so Wells Fargo was able to buy Wachovia, and predictably, about 15 or 16 days later, Citigroup had to be bailed out by the federal government. 
So, lesson learned. The most important job of a CFO is liquidity. Uh, it, is, it is very rare that a company fails because of you know, bad revenue momentum, costs being a little bit too high. Companies fail because they lack liquidity. And your job and responsibility as CFO of your company is to always be sure that liquidity is sound. That has to be your line in the sand. So what other, whatever other people say, that has to be kind of the, the guarantee. Now, let me just wrap up, if I can, with uh, kind of one last thing. And I know I'm running a little bit over here today, so I hope you're going to do this to me when I need to stop, because I will. So I'm going to ask you to speculate with me. This is not about politics, by the way. I just want you to speculate with me for just a second. I was just thinking about this as I uh, thought I might uh, come over and do this today. So I'd like you to suspend uh, belief for just a few minutes, and I'd like to have you think that instead of being September 22nd, 2011, it's actually September 22nd, 2026. So five years from today. So it's five years from today. Here is the situation that you, Ms. CFO or Mr. CFO, find yourself in. Over the last year, inflation has been bouncing between 6 and 7 percent, up nicely from the naive days in the middle of the pandemic when it was closer to 4 to 5 percent. And people used to say the quaint word, this is transi transitionary. That means that it takes today 40 percent more in revenue, 40 percent more in profitability than to earn exactly the same real amount that you earned five years earlier. Corporate tax rates are now at 29 percent, six full percentage points higher than they were back in 2021. The U.S. corporate tax rates were actually worldwide competitive for a brief period back in 2021, but now are six full percentage points against people you compete with around the world. Capital gains rates are 39 percent. Estate, estate tax exemptions have dropped to $3 million. The highest individual tax rates now kick in at $400,000. Uh, but you actually can get there if you make the same amount with the inflation uh, uh, of 240000 today. Uh, but personal ta income tax rates now exceed 50% in many states around the country. So layering on these tax rates back in 2021, when it sounded like such a good idea, resulted in a significant slowdown in the economy. Growth rates have been hovering around 1% in the economy. Unemployment is 8%. The high unemployment has resulted in stagnating wages. And that's been exacerbated by the fact that there have been millions of immigrants that have been willing to come in and work for lower wages. So as a result of widespread weaknesses in the economy, uh, as well as the massive impact on the co cost of government debt if interest rates went up, the Fed is unable to increase interest rates. So the Fed still has to keep interest rates low. These low interest rates kill the value of the dollar particularly when it relates to the renminbi, which is now uh, fully 50% higher relative to the dollar than it was back in 2021. That's caused imports that you're bringing in from China to be nearly unaffordable. This has put supply chains in a continual state of disarray over the last five years. So, isn't that a, a hopeful kind of scenario? <laughs> you sit at your desk and ask yourself, how in the world did we get here? And the answer to that is really quite simple. Uh, if you look at the promises that we've made over the last uh, 50 years that have to do with how Social Security is calculated, if you look at what uh, the kind of embedded expe expe expected cost is for Medicare and Medicaid, if you consider the unfunded pension liabilities, in fact, here's one interesting factoid for you. Um, to solve just the unfunded pension liability associated with state and local governments in the United States, based on what the Wall Street Journal said a few days ago, it would take four trillion dollars, which is the economic output of the country of Germany for one year. I mean, it's an amazing set of debt. Now, if you're confronted with debts that you cannot pay, then the tried and true answer, both in the United States as well as in uh, places around the world historically, has been to allow inflation to rise so that debt that was incurred in a previous time can be repaid with highly inflated dollars. And to not have that happen means only one of two things. Either there's going to be default on those obligations, which there is not going to be. Or second, there has to be political will that simply has shown no evidence of existing for a long period of time. 
So Bill Clinton had a little bit of political will back when, uh, when he restructured the budget and got the government on a pay-as-you-go kind of basis. Ronald Reagan had some budget discipline. But since Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan, there has been zero budget discipline. And I have uh, almost no confidence that the list of things that I talked about, the, the higher tax rates, the low uh, interest rates, the uh, deteriorating value of the dollar, are going to be real and present issues that we are all in the next four or five going to have to, uh, four or five years are going to have to face. So, instead of lessons learned, here's a few things that I would put on my list to worry about uh, if that actually came about. So first is, I would take a hard look at your supply chain. Whatever it is today, I'll bet it's going to be different five years from today. Uh, it, it may make sense actually to bring some of your production on shore. If you really think the dollar is going to deteriorate that much, then bringing it on shore could actually make, uh, make some, inter make some uh, sense. Second, evaluate your input costs. So some of the input costs that you have you can pass through because you know you have the ability to do that. Some you can't, and thinking about that and what it means in terms of product configuration and construction is a part of that. Think about training your workforce. So if we have, in fact, this 6 to 7% inflation over the next five years, which we may or may not have, but if we do, do have this uh, kind of inflation, that $15 minimum wage that is likely to happen this year is going to be more like a $21 minimum wage. Now there's going to be plenty of people that are willing to take advantage of that $21 minimum wage because those people are arriving by the hundreds of thousands each month into the United States today. So, but having a process in place to assimilate people at the lower end of the economic spectrum and providing employment opportunities for them and the training necessary for that is part of that. Number four is get smart about cyber currency. Uh, I would not personally invest the diamond cyber cur in cyber currency today because my own feeling is that it's just like trading foreign exchange. And if you, if you know anything about trading foreign exchange, it really is just a gambling process. So if you want to gamble, you can gamble. That said, I am, at least again, my feeling, I don't know, but my feeling is that uh, the, the only question here is time. And that with the passage of time, we're going to see that the impact on decisions we're making today on the dollar force a movement towards some kind of alternative uh, currency. And I don't know whether it's the ones that we currently talk about or others, but I have that feeling. If I were a CFO today, I'd be getting really smart on how cyber currency operates, what the issues are associated with it, so that if that is part of what our future ends up becoming, it's what you could, could uh, you'd be able to react. Uh, use debt. I, I, I don't have any debt personally, and I'm not recommending any of you have it, but I would recommend that you have debt in your businesses. Uh, you know, debt is gonna be Dear today and cheaper tomorrow. As inflation goes up, it'll be easier to repay. So it's a time to uh, lever up uh, as long as you feel confident about your business model and you'll pay it back in lower dollars. And then invest uh, what you think is right in uh, real assets. So we've already seen this enormous inflation rate in apartments and homes and things like that. People go around saying, I don't know why that's gone up so much. Well, it's gone up so much because inflation is 5% this year. I mean, it's really, it's really pretty simple. If you have hard assets that are delivering a predictable cash flow, that is going to have much higher value than uh, things that, that don't have that associated with it. So uh, anyway, there's a, a part of that. So those are the things that, uh, that I would think about. Uh, I think you all have one of the best jobs in the world. So being a CFO is a great job. You sit, as we heard a little bit from Dave, you sit sort of right at the core of, uh, of everything interesting that is happening in your business. You can let the CEO go be an optimist. You be a pessimist, because you have to have an optimist and a pessimist in every business, and, uh, and work out the future of your business together. And uh, that's an exciting job. It's not an accounting job. It's an exciting job that can really drive the success of your, uh, of your business. So two minutes. So two minutes for Q&A. Any questions that anybody has on any of those topics? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's absolutely true. Um, those of you who are not necessarily in banking might not fully uh, follow this, but so the issue here, during the financial crisis, it wasn't that these assets were necessarily a credit problem. They were actually rated very highly. The problem was you couldn't sell them no matter what, and so you had to take a liquidity discount that drove down the mark to market on these assets even though they were still performing and the probability is they would rebound and, and do very well. And that's, I think, what history has now proven. A lot of those assets recovered back to their value, but we were forced because of mark-to-market -mark accounting to take those gigantic write-offs even though they were still generally performing. So accounting oftentimes has these unintended consequences. We could do a whole other thing just on uh, the crazy things like that. Anybody else? Well. Great to be here, Dave. Thanks a million for giving me the chance to uh, to be with you guys today. I hope you have a terrific day together. So.